All right, good morning. Welcome. I'm so happy you're here. Uh, so uh, I have a little, I know it really, huh? When you consider the alternative, right? You know? I mean, <laughs> uh, so uh, I have a little story for you. Uh, an attorney called the other day. He was having a problem with his plumbing in his house and asked this particular plumber, you know, could you come right away? So the plumber goes right, right away. Later that day, he calls again the, the, the lawyer to the plumber and says, well, how did it go? And, uh, and the plumber says, oh, fine. I fixed the problem. It took me just, just two hours to do that. Oh, great. Well, can you bring by a bill? So the plumber brings the attorney a bill. And the bill is for $2,000. No. And the attorney looks at it and says, my gosh, $2,000. I mean, I'm glad you got it fixed, but I mean, really, $2,000? He says, I'm an attorney, and I don't make $1,000 an hour. And the plumber says, I didn't either when I was an attorney. <laughs> so um, Ernest Holmes says in our Science of Mind textbook that a healing is a revealing of the spiritual truth. So healing is not trying to make something happen. It's not trying to force anything. It's actually opening up the way, uncovering what is what we believe is already so. You know, elsewhere he says there's nothing to heal, there's only God to be revealed. All right, so when we think of healing, another way we could say that to ourselves is, okay, how do I reveal more God in this area of my life, in this interpersonal relationship, in my body temple, in my work life? How do I reveal more God? You know, for St. Paul, Heaven uh, was thought to be the future home of the believers, that when people died, they would go to heaven. Peter affirmed that heaven is a place where the believer's inheritance is kept until the revelation of the Messiah. So when I think of heaven, you know, and this was from a time when I was little, I thought of heaven as being up, right, like up, upstairs. Well, for us, metaphysically, heaven is a higher state of consciousness. For us, it's a, an awareness of our oneness with God is a heavenly state of consciousness. Now, for us in science of mind, we say, well, God is spirit. And so the creations of God, the things that God creates, are spiritual. And yes, they appear on the earth plane to be physical. They appear to be limited, but in fact, they are spiritual. And so, you know, it's an interesting thing to me that our mind, our human mind, interprets everything we see. Oh, this is good. Oh, that's bad. Or, you know, I'm out walking my dog and I see roses. So I, I bring something to the seeing of the roses. I used to have lots of rose bushes, you know? So I look at roses and I appreciate them. I bend down and I smell the roses in everybody's yard. I'm sure my neighbors all think I should be locked up. You know, who is this man in my front yard? You know, it's okay, okay, maybe I shouldn't have gone through the two gates. But, you know, it's... <laughs> I like them, you know, I bring something, or like you see somebody walking a dog, I see somebody with a yellow lab, I love yellow labs, and I go, oh my God, yellow labs, those are the greatest dogs in the world, I love them, I've had so many of them in my life. Right? Now, those are all, all of these things that we see, that we bring something to the seeing, all of these things are spiritual emanations of God. Now, Ernest Holmes said that the kingdom of heaven is available to us to the degree that we become aware of it. So think about that, to the degree that we become aware of it. So in any situation, in any relationship, if I could become aware of heaven, I could have a little piece of heavenly consciousness, a little bit of heaven on earth right there. But you know, it's not as easy, obviously, as it sounds, right? Because uh, to the degree that we become aware of it, well, that, yes, that's healing. But because we all bring unique things to the seeing, you know, we've all had unique influences in our journey. Uh, I guess there are prenatal influences, they say. And, and then, of course, there is our early environment and our education, the personal experiences that we have in life and things that we learn from the people we know and love or the people who we don't know and love. And, um, and what, what our individual soul comes in with as part of our assignment or, or something to heal. So that's what makes us, I think, what we are humanly. Everything I see, you know, I see through my past, my conditioning, and what my soul came in with. So if I look out and I see uh, a horrible world, those, influence, those influences of it being a horrible world are now at work in me. Also, if I see a wonderful, loving world peopled by wonderful, loving people, then those influences are at work 
in me. So it's not that my seeing, what I see in the world, has no impact on me. Abs quite, quite the contrary. It's just the opposite. What I see, how I interpret it, what I bring to that seeing, has everything to do with what I'm going to continue to experience. Um, if I look out and I see horrible, which is, you know, I know that would be easy to do. If I look out and I see good, I realize that's a little more work. So now when I say this, you know, don't hear, please don't think that I'm saying, oh, God, we, we, you know, it's your fault and you're a victim of, no, it's not that at all. But once you, you're, you're big, and we're all big here, you know, it, it becomes our responsibility to rise up and heal what needs to be healed. You know, face it. After a certain age, there's just a lot of stuff you just got to let go of. It's just too painful to carry it around. It gets too darn heavy. And the best thing we could do is let it go. And I know people so often don't want to do that because they think they're letting other people off the hook. It's not about them. This one is about you. It's about you taking out the hook and you being free. Let go. Give thanks for all of it. And like, oh, how can I give thanks for all of it? Because in some way or another, it has all contributed to our growth. You know, and the thing is, until we give thanks for all of it, we will never make the next step in our own spiritual progress, right? This is why an inner spiritual life is so incredibly important, because I cannot allow the interpretations of my mind to be the only thing that guides my life, right? Because what my mind is going to do is my mind is going to uh, reflect on the past and try and bring that past forward and project it into the future, right? So if I will get still... You know, if I will get still, getting still is the alternative to being tossed about like flotsam and jetsam on, on, on the world, in the world that we live in. I get still, and then I try to find some sense of assurance. What comes to me from within? So because I like to read the scriptures, you know, because I like to read the Bible, I'll, something will come when I close my eyes like, thou art my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Oh, that's nice. That's a good thing. I could sit with that. For a few minutes, okay, I am God's beloved child in whom God is well pleased. And then later it comes to me, you know, son, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. Well, I like that. That's really helpful because I'm teaching the abundance workshop right now. So it's good to know that everything God has is mine. That's a helpful and empowering thing to remember. See, the assurances that we, the assurances that we need don't come from out here. Ultimately, they bubble up from within ourselves. And so I know from past experience, my mind has the capacity to create good. Do you know that about yourself in your life? That your mind, used in the right way, can create good. Do you know that? Go like this. Yeah, okay, good. Just checking, just checking. Okay, and I also know, though, from past experience, that my mind has the capacity to create not good. Go like this. Yeah, yeah, right. I know that. I know that about myself. Um, and, and, uh, somebody uh, said to me, just like as a little offhanded thing, not that long ago, they said, well, tell me, you know, science of mind, uh, I, you know, I... And it was one of these conversations where it's like, oh, yeah, I did that. I did that. Science of mind, I did that. And I said, like, I love that. I just, you know, I, just, I just love that. And they say, oh, I did that, you know, like it was a firewalk or something. I did that. Um, he says, says to me, how many people do you know who are really happy? And I thought, well, I know a lot of people who are happy. Because I hang around with people who study the science of mind, to tell you the truth. And it doesn't mean that nobody has challenges, because we certainly, certainly do. But, but I think that more people I know are happier because of practicing this teaching than, say, a lot of people who are not practicing the teaching. Nothing against them. I think it's about that, that Ernest Holmes gave us tools to work with that, again and again, those tools help me get out of a pit when I find myself in the pit. You know, in A Course in Miracles, it says daily the teacher of God, which would be all of us. That means, the Course says everyone is a teacher of God. The teacher of God... Um, has to say this, God, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say? And to who? In other words, you're saying to God, to spirit, to the infinite mind, I want to be your vessel here on earth today. Use me for a purpose greater than myself. Thank God. Right? So from the Hebrew legends, King Solomon, who I like very, very much, uh, he was well, this is wealthy, wise, uh, builder of temples, King Solomon, right? He sat on the throne not as a seat of power, but as a seat of truth. This is what I think makes him so interesting. Solomon judged not by his own authority, but by the truth of God as it was revealed in the Torah. Right? So his decisions were always linked to the highest truth he knew. 
You know, incidentally, this is why none of the kings who later uh, captured the throne were able to sit on it despite the power that they held, right? So like Solomon, I think we want to judge a righteous kind of judgment. We want the greatest spiritual truth here. You know, what do the scriptures promise? What does Ernest Holmes tell us is available to us in the mind of God in our textbook? See, the thinking and experiences of the world, I think, is, is, is always trying to force itself on us. You know, we're surrounded by news on TV and on the radio and on the internet and newspapers and people's conversations and people's being people out in the world, right? So I'm being affected by my conscious mind, right? These are the thoughts I'm thinking right now. I'm also being affected by my subconscious mind, which is everything that I have been through, everything I've ever thought, everything that's ever been said to me. Okay, so my thinking, the thinking of the world around, uh, everything that I've ever experienced, and then there's the thinking, the global thinking of the world that we live in. All of these are pressing in on us all the time. This is why we have to be master of our own consciousness. This is why we have to take charge of our thinking. You know, I can't just let my thinking go willy-nilly this way and that way, because then I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to have any kind of dominion over my own experience, right? I have to have a strong spiritual consciousness to not be subject to all of the thinking of the world around me, to not be at the effect of the experiences of the world around me. So I think the first part of our spiritual journey is about improving our life so that our human good gets better. You know, we want to handle our health, and, and Ernest Holmes gives us tools to do that. We want to handle our prosperity and abundance. Ernest Holmes gives us tools to do that. We want to handle our interpersonal relationships. Ernest Holmes and the Science of Mind gives us tools to do that. So we're, because, you know, early on, we're sure that if I could just have these things be okay, these outer areas of my life, everything would be good, and I'd be really, really happy. Well, that's, that's great. You know, so we make some progress with that, right? but they're not the ultimate goal of our life. They're, they're markers along the way. So, you know, being able to handle your health, that's, that's a marker along the way. And be, having better interpersonal relationships is a marker on the way. They're markers of the expansion of consciousness that you're having, that you're growing more, that spirit is alive in you and expressing in a greater way. I think Ernest Holmes, our founder, really, really understood this. He said, because... First, we stabilize these outer structures of our life through mental science before we're ready to go deeper spiritually and do the work of spiritual science. So he initially called our teaching the science of mind and spirit because there was a mental science component but also a spiritual science component. Uh, by the way, in September, I'll be teaching a class uh, based on Emma Curtis Hopkins' book, Scientific Christian Mental Practice, and this is our introduction, I think, into spiritual science, so I hope you will come be with me for that. Ernest said, Jesus was a man who knew himself and his direct relationship to the whole. This was the secret of his success. So knowing our direct relationship to the whole, knowing that we are connected with God, with spirit, with a principal power and presence, this is what's going to assure us of some level of success. See, a consciousness of oneness, that's the kingdom consciousness, and that, in fact, is healing. You know, we're related to the whole world. How is that possible? Well, because we're one with God, and on the unseen side of life, the science of mind teaches us that we are connected with all people everywhere. We are filled with the all good. Right? So our trouble is not a wrathful God. Our trouble is the darkness that exists within our own mind. Mm -hmm. Our own minds. Uh, our trouble is the darkness that exists in the minds of other people that we allow to come into our mind. Right? Um, so the idea is that we take a little time to rest in the spiritual truth. What is the spiritual truth? That we are stronger than whatever our fears are. We are greater than whatever our weakness may be. That we are not victims, we are one with God, with spirit. So the kingdom of heaven, you know, I love this parable, where the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Everybody's heard that. I remember back in the 70s, used to, people used to wear these little mustard seeds suspended in acrylic around their neck, you know. And, uh, but the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed uh, that someone took and sowed in a field. 
Uh, it's the smallest of seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and may nest in its branches. Okay, so little seed becomes big tree over time. The mustard seed, hmm, this could be our consciousness. You know, in fact, I think this is what the, the story is really about. You know, our current level of awareness, you know, our current level of faith, our current belief in God, right? And so, I give it, my faith, the proper conditions in consciousness. You know, I pray, and I study, and I read, and do all the things that I do to create the right environment so that my faith can grow, like the mustard seed, right? The response, you know, it's, but it, it is now our responsibility to create the proper conditions for our consciousness to be of a higher order, for our consciousness to not be uh, the same as the consciousness of the world that we're living in, because I believe that people who are connected to a higher spiritual truth will always, always be okay. Now, the great thing about this is that people will look at you and say, well, why is it going so well for you? And you can tell them, right? The idea is not to keep yourself down to make other people feel better. The idea is for you to be raised up, and then other people can say, what are you doing? And you can share with them what you're doing, right? So I think that being close to the spiritual truth in times of difficulty is our strength. That's really a power in our favor here. So here's a mustard seed. Think about that. Just this little bit of something, right? So we may have just the, the smallest amount of faith sometimes. We might be 90% not faith and maybe only just 10%. Well, maybe something good could happen here. And people so often say, well, but, but I just don't see it. I don't see how. I don't see how. To which I have to say, thank God we're a metaphysical teaching. We're not basing what's possible on what we see or experience with our five senses. We step back and say, but there's a greater spiritual truth in the mind of God, and it's here, and I'm available to it, and I will give voice to it. Even if I don't see it, even if you don't see it, it's still right where we are, if only in potential. And we get to stir that up. Let's pray. Thank you. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment just to remember that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit. That in the mind of God, we are all God's beloved. Every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth is beloved to God. And so knowing that we are connected with God, I further know that we are all connected with each other on the unseen side of life. And in this awareness of our connection, I speak the word for each and every one of us that healing is happening in our life exactly where it needs to happen right now. So whether it's in our interpersonal relationships or our finances, whether it's our body temple or our creative expression or some other area, whatever it is, we speak our word together today that God is present right there. That nothing needs to be added. We are unlayering. We are letting go of all that obstructs, obstructs the perfection of infinite loving spirit within us and our lives. So we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children, everyone that we hold near and dear, and we know that God is right where they are, that they too are surrounded and filled with a principle and a power and a presence that serves them perfectly in every way. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So opening our hearts, we let an energy of love and peace and healing emanate out from us to touch all people everywhere on the face of the globe. No one excluded. We say God is present in all of it, as healing, as peace, as right action, as all needs met. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I know we're blessed by being together. So with an open, gracious, full heart, I give thanks and I release this word. And so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.